church ought to be like in the Bible. And unfortunately, there's a lot of churches today, not only do they not measure up, they don't even care. They've got their own agenda. They've got their own thing. As long as they're happy doing their own thing, running their programs, that's all they care about. Well, not here. Grace Baptist Church. I, I'm not happy until we start growing and measuring up to God's Word because this is, this is what God expects. And so that's what we want to measure up to God's Word. Here in Ephesians 4.15, it says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, we talk about the whole body, we talk about all Christians, the whole body combined are the Christians. And he's using the analogy of a human body. So the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. Every Christian should be a part of God's church and of a local church. And, and, it, and it grows according to the effective working by which every part does its share. So we have to ask ourselves, are you doing your share? Are you contributing to the ministry of Christ on earth today? Are you involved? Every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And so the church really uh, is a, a body. There's different analogies. Uh, it's a building with all the different stones. And, and God uses a number of analogies, but the body is one. And we're all to be active interconnected, interdependent, working and contributing for the whole. That's what God says a church is to be like, and all Christians are parts of that body working together. Are we? Church is also like a beehive. It ought to be a hive of activity. But all those worker bees, are they here all week? No. They're out of the hive. This sort of represents us when we're together, a hive of activity. But those bees spread out and they fly all over working for what? The good of the hive, really, don't they? And that's what the Christians are to do. We spread out throughout the week and we carry with us uh, the gospel and, and the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're kind of like a hive of activity. There's five different terms in the Bible, in, in the New Testament, that talk about our work, our activity as a believer. Now, the New Testament was originally, back 2,000 years ago, was written in Greek. And uh, when the Holy Spirit of God superintendent, the Apostle Paul or Peter or John, when they actually wrote the scriptures, they wrote it in Greek, and they wrote the very word, words, singular, plural, possessive, whatever. They wrote exactly what God wanted them to write. That's, that's why it's the very word of God. It's not just the word of men. This is God's word given through men as they wrote it down, and God the Holy Spirit assured, superintendent, uh, that it was written down exactly. And so we talk about the words that are used in Scripture, and actually they're the words that the Holy Spirit chose to use. And, and we can study these. And, and so there's some of these are Greek words, ergon, but it's translated work or working. Uh, kopos. Those are the only two we're going to look at today, okay? So, you know, this, is, this is labor month, too, okay? So we're going to get a couple more of these. But, but sometimes we get the cart before the horse, don't we? in a lot of areas of life. Well, the same thing with works. And God says 28 times that we're supposed to do good works. The thing that we get backwards sometimes is a lot of people have this idea, well, I'm supposed to do good works, and that that will please God. And like, if I do these good works, I can earn my salvation. And as if my good works are more than my bad works, then I'll, I'll please God and I'll get into heaven. No, no, no. The scriptures are very clear that that's not how the works work. <laughs> Uh, that's getting the cart before the horse. Uh, God says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 and 10, it says, For we're saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What's the gift of God? The grace of salvation, the faith by which we even believe. That's all the gift of God. That's not of us. It's all the gift of God. And we're saved. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. And then it says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And so, so we are saved by grace through faith, through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then once we are a Christian, once we are truly saved, born again by God, then we do good works because we love him and we want to serve him. And so the good works follow our salvation. In fact, uh, Titus chapter 3, 
Paul wrote this, he says to Titus, he says that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works, ergo. <laughs> Once you believe, you we're saved by faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and faith alone. But once you believe, then you do these good works to honor and serve our Lord. So, so don't do good works thinking you're going to earn your salvation. That doesn't work. You'll end up in the wrong place. I guarantee it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then do the good works to honor and glorify him. There's another word. It's the word kopos. And this word comes from a verb which means to chop, to cut, to saw. And it's a word which, which really means, it's even beyond work. It, it carries work to the laborious <laughs> connotation. It's not just work. That first work, the word work, it had the idea of just doing your duty. It's, it, do it. And, and it's work, it's not pleasure, it's work. And unfortunately, when God calls us, He says, get up, it's time to go to work, Christians. You're my children. I want you to do the household chores. I want you to take care of my business. I want you to be on a mission. That's what God's work is. But now he says, he's using this other term, which means toil, labor. Labor is a good translation of this word. Um, Anna Hartley is extremely pregnant. In fact, in the next day, two days, week, she will be delivering a little baby boy. And she will be going through something that women call labor. <laughs> She's going to have a gay old time. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> relaxing. No, it's not. It, the recurring contractions are exhausting. It's laborious. It's painful. I don't know, but that's what they tell me anyways. <laughs> I, I talk like I know what I'm talking about. Well, I was there to witness my wife going through it twice, and uh, I felt terrible for her. Um, but uh, that's called labor, and it's called labor for a reason. And that's the word that God chose to describe what he expects of us as Christians. Not the unbelievers. They're busy laboring for Satan and for the world, for their own pleasure. But for Christians, we labor for the Lord. If you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I just want to look at one verse. He says in verse 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. There's the word work. Ergon, the first word we looked at. That's doing your duty and, and, and abounding in that. Just constantly doing the work of the Lord. Now, I know a lot of people are busy working. They're workaholics. But they're working for Kodak or Xerox or they're working for their own business or their own pleasure or they're working for uh, whatever. That's not what he's talking about. He says work abounding in the work of what? The Lord. In other words, we have to get up every morning and think to myself, my life is going to be lived as a work for the Lord. Everything I do, I want to do the Lord's will. I want to do my duty as a Christian. I want to live out the Christian life and do what I'm supposed to do. I want to bear that witness in the light of the gospel. In my life, every day, I go to work for the Lord. And that's for all of us. So that's what he says, abounding in the work of the Lord. And notice this. Knowing that your labor, your labor, kopos, that tiring, monotonous, repetitious, uh, wearying work is not in vain. That same word was used uh, for doing hard labor, mining. I don't remember about mining coal 2,000 years ago, but the term was used for mining rock. Um, when they were building the temple and different things, the mining of rock, uh, of scything. Uh, the apostles used it when Jesus said, if you caught anything, and Peter says, Lord, we have toiled all night. Got nothing. I've had a few fishing days like that myself. <laughs> but my fishing was uh, relaxed fishing. These guys toiled all night. It was their job. Casting the nets, dragging them in, casting the nets, dragging them in. They were exhausted come morning. It was labored all night, caught nothing. That's the word. That word toil, kopos. In John chapter 4, uh, when Jesus got to Sychar, uh, the, the, the area of the Samaritans, the woman at the well there, and he sat down, he was thirsty, it says he was wearied from his journey. Wearied. That's the area. Those are the mountains of Samaria there. He went 20 miles from Jerusalem down to Sychar. 
It was no easy journey. And that word there, wearied, is a form of the word kopos. It's, it's a monotonous, gut-wrenching, wearying type work. And, and the Lord, it's, he's kind of expecting Christians to do that. Now, I know that most of us are what we call Christian work. doesn't really measure up to what God says here about laboring for the Lord. We, we say, well, I made a pan of brownies for the dinner the other day. <laughs> Guess that my, my work for the Lord is done for the week. Wow, I really strived. <laughs> no, that's not serving. That's not labor. That is a ministry. It's a kind thing to do and helps out. But, but it doesn't qualify for what Paul says here is knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When we do our labor for the Lord and in the Lord's will and in His service and for His mission, when we're laboring like that, if, it's, if we're going to qualify for the blessing here, it's got to be labor. It's got to be some type of strenuous, repetitious, difficult work that we do for the Lord. I don't know, honestly, if I've hardly ever done anything like that. Now, I think he does refer to being physically exhausting, but spiritually, emotionally, and mentally exhausting for the Lord. Have you ever given out, put yourself out like that for the Lord, for something that would qualify as abounding in the work of the Lord and labor in the Lord? See how we measure up? we got a ways to go, don't we? We've got a ways to go. But here's the promise, knowing that your labor is not in vain. It's not useless, it's not empty. There's a reward, there's a blessing, there's a purpose behind it. God sees that. And we keep laboring because we know that there is a blessing. <clears throat> Interesting, we often take this verse out of its context. Just, just gander back in chapter 15 this afternoon, perhaps. Chapter 15, in which this verse is found, is the most important book in the whole Bible on the resurrection. It talks about the future glorious resurrection of the believer. And it is that which causes us, motivates us to toil, work, and labor for the Lord Jesus. It's not as if someday we're going to die and it doesn't matter. No, someday we're going to go to glory. We're going to be resurrected and it all matters. And we will know that our work for the Lord, our labor in the Lord, is worth it all. It's all because of the resurrection. Because someday we'll stand with him in glory and we'll say, was I really worried about working on my yard, my garden, my back deck? Was I really worried about working so hard to get a new video game or an ATV or a new boat? And here I am now standing in glory in the presence of my Savior for eternity. And I'm thinking, uh oh, I wish I'd labored a little more for him. Well, that's the opportunity we have now. We labor for the Lord. I would encourage you to measure yourself, not against the world or against other Christians. How well do we measure up according to what God says in His Word? Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor, your labor is not in vain. Let's rededicate ourselves to, to, to rigorously serving the Lord. Uh, Mary... I don't know if you recall that passage in Romans chapter 16. It says, uh, Paul says, In Greek, Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Mary. We don't know anything else about There's, I think, seven different Marys in the New Testament. We don't really know anything about this lady. Other than she was in the church of Rome. And Paul says she bestowed much labor. Apparently what she did to serve the church and to serve Paul and Silas and others that were ministers there... Apparently it was pretty rigorous. I don't know if she got up at 4 o'clock, walked miles down to the market, loaded food and grain and stuff on her back, took it back to her house, chopped, diced, ground, baked stuff for the apostles, went down many trips to the well to provide water for their drinking and bathing. Whatever she did, I don't know, but it was laborious. And Paul mentions Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. For the Lord's work. That's what we're supposed to do. Mary's laboring for the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word. And we just pray that we might be faithful, trying to measure up to your word. Uh, that we would have our works in order. First of all, that we've trusted you as our Lord and Savior. We become uh, your children by faith first. And then 
that we work to serve you because we love you. And we're so grateful for all you've done for us. And because we know that there is a resurrection unto eternal glory someday. And so we serve gladly. Thank you, Father. We just ask you to bless the second part of our service now as the Hartleys come and minister to us in song. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As the Hartleys to say, <coughs> wow, the Hartleys were such a blessing. I thank the Lord that he had us visit your church the day they were there. This is last year. We enjoyed having them visit with us in our home. We had a good time of fellowship and a meal after the concert. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for arranging us to have them. Then he goes on, he says, I think word of mouth is going to spread in our church and the community about them. Their talent on those instruments is phenomenal. Abby's voice is angelic. And I might add, so is Micah's. <laughs> They're really a great family. I can see why you enjoy hosting them in your home. And uh, tell them, Tom, Anytime you're going through, stop for a meal. And he says, uh, my time with them was so encouraging to me personally. This is not a unique letter. I get these kind of frequently from pastors and people. I've said, uh, I don't like bluegrass music. I don't care if you like the music or not. Come on, anyways, you'll love, you'll love the blessing of God on their life and their ministry. And uh, they have proved to be a blessing everywhere they go. We had a great concert Monday, and uh, we'll turn it over to them now and just get some more of the blessing. Amen. Thanks a lot, Tim, and uh, I'm glad my daughter's email came through. <laughs> <laughs>
y'all. Um, it's a blessing to be back here. It's like a reunion seeing everybody, and, and we're just blessed. The Lord is good to us to allow us to keep coming back here with our family. Um, we are, we've shrunk a little, but we're growing too because Anna's having a new one. So we have three grandchildren after Anna has hers. We'll have three, and the kids are all doing well. They're um, working and going to school and having a good old time. So I guess they're having a good time. <laughs> That's a good time. But anyway, we're glad to be here. Oh, a change in instruments here. Everybody, good to see everybody and appreciate y'all coming out. Hey, this is the weather I came up here for right here. <laughs> Wasn't it nice this morning, that cool air coming in? Of course, uh, of course, y'all won't be saying that about two months from now. Huh? <laughs> but uh, get all that you can out of summer, but we're sure glad to see it. Uh, well, this is the kind of weather we come up here to, to have. And uh, man, I sit out in the porch there. Uh, on the deck, Tim's deck, and drank coffee this morning watching those leaves fall as the wind blew through. Just brought a lot of memories back. It's funny, we uh, played, we've been on the road now for about seven weeks. Played in Minnesota, Illinois, and Wisconsin, and uh, played 29 concerts in August. We've never played that much before, and I don't think we'll ever do it again. <laughs> But we never have trouble with overscheduling. We always have trouble un un underscheduled, we always feel like. So I told them just whatever comes in, that's what we'll play. And so that came in and we played it. But we were wore out. And I was looking forward to some rest when I got over here. And then Tim started this series called Labor Day Messages <laughs> Labor Week. Words like work and strenuous, you know, and diligence and striving. And, and uh, man, I was looking forward to sitting on the deck for a few days. <laughs> anyway, we're glad to see y'all here today. Um, so many new, new, different people from, that have come that I can't call everybody, but I'm going to pick on one family. Gary and Candace Wigden are here from down uh, close. Y'all live close to Can Canandaigua? Is that kind of the area y'all live in? And, uh, and their family back here to my right, back here, that, that pew that's all filled up. Isn't that a beautiful family back yes. there? Y'all give them a good hand. <laughs> the story I told Labor Day, the concert about Render Sella, and I told it on Uncle Larry. Well, that's his brother right there. So anyway, we got some different instruments. We're going to try to play a tune for you here. Me and Mike got to uh, do a dual banjo, and Abby's playing a new guitar here. We'll try.
thank Ken Van Norman. Did I say that right? Ken Van Norman. We're bringing his guitar here. Have you played here? And Tim Bandles. New banjo. <laughs> yeah. And I honestly must say, this is one of the sweetest banjos that I have ever played. And, uh, and, and I think Micah thinks the same thing. And while he's not look, looking tomorrow morning when we leave to go to the Adirondacks, he better have a, a lock up on that banjo. <laughs> I'd like to do a song that we... Uh, We've been doing since last year, and, and our new CD, uh, Faith Serves, goes right along with a series of messages that Tim is uh, preaching right now on, uh, on the, the labor of the church. And in last year as we travel, we were so inspired by different people we were meeting along the way and the way they served the Lord. And uh, there was, and we, in some of the songs that we'll sing, I don't have much time this morning, but some of the songs that we sang Labor Day, these all came from those experiences and those people we met along the way. Uh, we were inspired while we were in the Adirondacks by a name, guy named George, and I think I shared that yeah. story. Did I do that Labor Day, the George, George song? Yeah. Did that Labor Day? Well, George is not the only one that's on that front of that CD. There's a number of people. But uh, eight or nine years ago, our family, we had all the kids then, were playing in a place called uh, uh, Ozark Folk Center, which is in Mountain View, Arkansas, and a couple came there on vacation from New York, and they saw on the internet this festival, and they stopped by, and after we played, Tim Bandle came up and introduced <laughs> himself and, and asked me if we would consider coming to New York and playing, and that was eight, about eight years ago, eight or nine years ago, and we immediately became like family with him and Debbie, and they have so inspired us and my kids, I think God brought them into our family at the right time, at the right place, like He always does, because they made such an impact not only on Deb and myself, but upon our kids at a stage in life where they needed to see a family and a husband and wife in particular that were given their life to serve God and serve people. And to me, uh, Tim and Debbie Bantle embody and they're incarnate in that sense that they flesh out that concept and we've watched them through the years. And the way they make us feel when we get to their house, I mean, they make us feel like we're just right at home. And, uh, and I know everybody here could tell a story of how Tim and Debbie have served in your family and in your life. But anyway, without telling the story of George, I won't go into that today. <laughs> But anyway, uh, we wrote this song inspired by people like Tim and Debbie and George and other people. It's called Live to Serve. Think of yourself living up as what the world will say. For happiness, grab all you can and go your own way. Your bigger arms and store your stuff.
already noon, so I better shut this thing down. We better, uh, we gotta do let Michael play one banjo tune for you that I really like. You know, one way to serve Tim is to give banjos away as people come through. <laughs> Amen! Amen! Now, that's one way. <laughs> that is the banjo I've been searching for for 13 years now. <laughs> nice tone. Tim also has my old banjo. It's an Arkansas banjo, and it's a good banjo also. <laughs> you don't know where I'm going with this, don't you? Hey, Micah has one. I brought two, so we have five banjos in the house right now, and poor Miss Dev hadn't got a wink of sleep since we've been there. We hadn't practiced this one, but I kind of wanted to, this is our last day here, I kind of wanted to Kind of wanted, this is not an easy, easy banjo song, but Micah learned it and he always picks the hardest songs to learn and we'll get him to, to do that one. But uh, anyway, I just want to say this before he says that, before he plays there, because it is in a different tuning. Make sure you're in tune there, we'll make sure you're good tuning there. <laughs> really don't work good if you're not. Uh, one thing I've noticed that we played over in Rome. Y'all not the only people that go to Italy. Yeah. <laughs> we played in Rome the other day, and uh, there was a pastor from Syracuse that came. And, <laughs> and uh, he was a fellow wrestler. He knew Tim back when they wrestled. And I found this to be true that whenever I would say, they would say, well, how, how, why did you, how did you get up here and that stuff? And I'll tell a story and I'll mention Tim Bantle's name and everywhere I go, he has a good name. Yeah. And they say, oh yeah, Tim Bantle, that's a good man right there. Amen. And uh, that makes me feel good and should make you feel good exactly. also that Amen. I would be associated with a man like Tim and Debbie Bantle. So I appreciate it. Let's give them a good hand. We appreciate it.
Josh. So, so good to be here. This is our last day here. We'll be playing in Williamson tonight. And then we leave tomorrow for the Adirondacks. We'll be up there the rest of the month of September. And then we'll head back home uh, October 3 or 4, I think. We, 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 we got to play in a festival in Arkansas on October 7th. So invite everybody to that one down there, Turkey Track. <laughs> it's in Northwest Arkansas. It's a beautiful area. And sure be welcome there. 80 acres of RVs and people jamming all through the night. You can't get a wink of sleep if you stay on the ground. That's for sure. What a wonderful pleasure it is that year by year we've been able to come up and play here. And I want to thank y'all always because y'all have always supported us and encouraged us in and, and all the way. And thank you so much for uh, the letters and emails that we've gotten. And uh, y'all are blessed to have a wonderful family here in this church. And uh, we are so appreciative of this church. And thank you so much. We'll end today with a song that Abby wrote. And I like the message in it. Just basically tells us God doesn't change. You know, if you've ever dealt with somebody that said something one day and then the next day they were some some other way, they said something else. I, I hate to work for somebody like that. They want it this way and then they change and want it that way. It's hard to work for a person that does that. And, but God never does that. God stays the same today, yesterday, and wherever. If He ever did anything for anyone, the Bible says He'll do it for you. Says he's the same yesterday, today, forever. I am God, I change not, says in Malachi. So I love this this song and we'll close with it. God doesn't change. <laughs>
<laughs> my guitar. And what happened was, it's the touch of the master's hand. And that's just like our lives. It's not until the Lord Jesus gets a hold of you and makes you into something that you're really what you could be. And uh, I could play this thing all day long and you'd be running out of here. In fact, I played for Abby a couple nights ago. After two songs, she was sick to her stomach. She had to run out of the room. <laughs> but the touch of the Master's hands make all the difference. And maybe your life is like that. Maybe you've made a mess of your life. You need to turn it over to the Lord Jesus and you can make a beautiful thing out of your life. So, if you don't know the Lord Jesus is your Savior, we encourage you to do so today or come and talk to one of us. And we'd love to sit down and show you from the Word of God, pray with you, uh, so you're one of His children. Heavenly Father, thank You for this great day. Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the message and songs that we've heard and the beauty of the music. Thank You for the Hartley family, Father, and for their Christian testimony, the love of God that overflows out of them and in, uh, in the songs, in the messages, and in their life. And we just pray, Father, that each one will go from here today knowing, knowing that they're a child of God. And if there's any doubt, that they'll uh, be sure before they go home that they give their lives to the Master, to the Lord Jesus. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.